Bola and welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. My name is Frances and I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Education here at USP. I'm also the Associate Dean for Research and International at the Faculty of Arts, Law and Education. I will be your facilitator in this lecture. We hope that you enjoy your learning journey. In this short presentation, you will be introduced to Pacific Heritage Arts. Module 4 is comprised of two lectures which are designed around major learning outcomes. The learning outcomes for this lecture are as follows. By the end of the session, you will be able to A. Recognize Pacific Heritage Arts, or PHA, as significant epistemological sites or sites of knowledge. You will also be able to evaluate the role and function of Pacific Heritage Arts as expressions of both cultural and natural heritage. And finally, you will be in a better position to assess the changing landscape of Pacific cultural communities and critique contemporary transformations of Pacific heritage arts in a globalized world. To begin our discussion, let me first reiterate that there is no such thing as a singular Pacific island culture. So when we refer to specific cultural references, it is very important that we specify the cultural community in context. However, having said that, there are some common features across the subregions we have come to know as Melanesia, Polynesia, and Micronesia. When we make general references to the Pacific Islands and the ways of life of Pacific communities, we are in fact drawing from these commonalities. Before we get into the discussion on Pacific heritage arts, Let's take a moment to focus our attention on the broader cultural context. A common feature of Pacific Island cultural communities, which is shared with indigenous communities all over the world, is a holistic worldview. We might refer to this as a holistic ontology, which places humans in a relationship between the relational self, family, clan and community, the natural environment, the ancestors and the gods. And it is this core life philosophy which forms the foundation of an indigenous worldview. Our languages, our ways of life and our rituals all reinforce this relational self. Within this understanding, Pacific heritage arts not only provide an insight into our relational selves, but also into our identities which are inherently collectivist or communal in nature. To use the terminology from psychology, we might say a collectivist sense of self. Or in anthropology or sociology terms, we might say a communal selfhood. So we see a real problematic emerge when we engage in framing our world using imposed non-Pacific ways of seeing the world, defining culture and heritage and what is important. For example, while indigenous peoples see the world as holistic and connected, we have now become conditioned to differentiate between tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And while this may serve a United Nations agenda in helping to safeguard all forms of cultural heritage, which might otherwise be at risk, it challenges and begins to reframe our ways of thinking about our own cultural spaces. This process has a colonizing impact, which imposes ways of thinking and doing that are not authentic or not our own. The same is true for natural and cultural heritage. Today we are able to list those aspects of natural and cultural heritage using these imposed frames. But if you return to the relational worldview, the holistic ontology, you will see that they are relational and one cannot be referenced without the other. Essentially, heritage, both cultural and natural, lies at the heart of who indigenous Pacific peoples are and everything that they do. The entire life system and human engagement within it is framed holistically. Hawaiian scholar, activist and educator Manulani Mea sums it up eloquently. She says, we simply see, hear, feel, taste and smell the world differently. 
Let us look at a shared example across Fiji, Tonga and Samoa, the heritage art form commonly referred to as tapa cloth, masi in Fiji, ngatu in Tonga and siapo in Samoa. Here we see a selection of a number of pieces of masi kesa or Fijian tapa. This photograph was taken at a recent display by Fijian heritage artists at the 2016 Festival of Pacific Arts held in Guam. Fijian masi or tapa is distinctive in that its designs are neat and compact, generally distinguishable by rows of patterns. These patterns are comprised of repeated imprints or designs. Fijian masi makers once used leaves as stencils and also painted freehand onto white cloth made from the mulberry tree, which is believed to have been brought to the Pacific Islanders by early settlers journeying from Asia. Today, many women make use of contemporary stenciling materials, including X-ray film. In Fiji, like Samoa and Tonga, tapa cloth is presented at births, weddings and deaths where they form an important part of the traditional bedding for the newborn child, the newly wedded couple or for the deceased. In contemporary times, it has become common to use either Tongan or Samoan tapa for these cultural obligations in Fijian ceremonies. This reinforces cultural ties and connections between the three islands. There are also a number of shared tapa designs which may be found across the islands. Here we see a very old ngatu or Tongan tapa made in 1970 at Telema Alekisio's final kokaanga at Kolomatua, a village in Nukualofa in Tonga. A kokaanga refers to the making of ngatu in the Tongan context, and Tongan women form collectives referred to as kautaha kokaanga to engage in this group activity of tapa making. While tapa cloth today is coarse to the touch, this particular ngatu has the texture of a felt textile or velvet and is soft to the touch. It's easy to see how tapa was once used as clothing, curtains and blankets. Designs are imprinted onto the ngatu using traditional tiles or tablets made from coconut fiber or senet, which are stitched onto a coconut fiber backing. When stored correctly, these kupesi tablets may be passed down through at least three generations. Today, the most common way of designing a ngatu is freehand, or a combination of use of the kopesi tui, or tablets, and freehand printing. Tongans continue to pass on the names and significance of each design, as well as engage in the creation of new designs, applying the traditional rules of Tongan kupesi design. This ngatu has not yet had the darkened overlay printed by hand to emphasize each design. In both Tonga and Samoa, black tapa was once used for weddings and funerals. This practice has declined and is now rarely seen or practiced. Tongans in New Zealand have also created a new kind of ngatu, which is made with a cloth backing called vilin. Paper tapa, called ngatu pepper, are also used to decorate celebratory or funeral spaces. There is a strong cultural link between Tongan and Samoan cultural practice, although many changes have emerged over the years. Here we see two contemporary pieces of siapo that were purchased at the Apia market in Samoa. You will notice that Samoan siapo contains repetitions of fewer patterns, unlike the Fijian masikesa which is quite compact and contains a diversity of designs. Like the Tongan ngatu, Samoan Siapo designs were once imprinted with the use of senet tablets called upeti fala. However, the introduction of iron and modern tools led to the development of what is now called upeti papa or wooden boards. These boards contained carved designs 
which act in a reverse printing design process. Designs are then emphasized with the darker overcolors. In Samoa, it is interesting that contemporary Siapo now features designs which were once reserved for female and male tattoo. The same is also commonly found in Siapo printed fabrics. Some may see this as a break in cultural protocol and the sacred use of symbols which are specifically to be used on the sacred body and those used to reinforce sacred relationships in the community. Others see it as cultural change and continuity, which is inevitable over time. What is your view? It is important to note a serious issue concerning the framing of heritage arts in the Pacific. First, there is no single one-word translation for the word art. Each heritage artwork has its own traditional name, and the artisan or designated creator family or clan has a specific name ascribed to him or her on the basis of the art form. Today, we readily use the words art and contemporary arts, and sadly, the inherited colonial name, handicraft, has also stuck with heritage artisans now referred to as craftsmen or craftswomen. The word handicraft is problematic and reflective of a colonial mindset. It does not take into consideration the complex social order or worldview of the societies for whom these creations hold deep spiritual and cultural significance. Take, for example, the names we ascribe to contemporary artists. We call them poets, writers, painters, fashion designers, etc. On the other hand, our traditional carvers, potters, weavers, and tapa makers are clustered as craftspeople. UNESCO 1997 provides the following definition of handicrafts, which is quite broad. This is still problematic because it clusters all creative works made by hand under one umbrella. This clusters Christmas wreaths and decorations made from natural fibers in the same category as a mat, a tapa cloth, and even traditional pottery or carving. Here we have two images, a hand-woven rug, which could be made from old clothes scraps, and a photo frame made from old bottle tops and buttons. Both of these may be categorized as handicrafts. If what we are seeking is a more holistic understanding of Pacific heritage arts, we need to first decolonize our thinking and shed those all too often used terminology such as tribal arts, primitive arts, oceanic arts, or traditional crafts. As mentioned previously, there is no one word for art in Pacific languages. And as Kepler 2007 explains, it can be hard to differentiate just about anything, including, as in her definition, plastic arts. Even though these arts made from plastic do not have spiritual significance attached to them. So how do we arrive at a holistic understanding of heritage arts? Heritage arts may be seen as entry points into the knowledge base of a particular cultural community. They speak of closed and open knowledge systems, where open knowledge refers to common knowledge that everyone has access to, such as sitting arrangement in the village meeting house. Closed knowledge, on the other hand, is sacred knowledge and gave status to a particular clan or family. Within this closure, knowledge and skills are further closed by gender, such as male knowledge about navigation, or women's knowledge about weaving or tapa making. Because the mana or spiritual energy exchanged or believed to be imbued in a particular heritage art form was considered either male or female, it was not common to have cross-gender participation. This is beginning to change, however, in some contexts, with young men taking up weaving or helping in the preparation of tapa. 
There are six entry points through which Pacific Heritage Arts may be viewed. First, functionality. Pacific Heritage Arts are primarily functional in nature, serving very specific purposes within the broader cultural practice, and as such are valid and valuable cultural epistemological sites of knowing, being, doing and belonging. What this means is that Pacific Heritage Arts allow us an insight into indigenous knowledge systems. Second, spirituality. Spiritual indigenous notions of nurturing a cultural balance are imbued in the conception, creation and cultural function of all of our art forms. Third, social order. The arts are central to understanding cultural maintenance of social, political hierarchy and social order within the cultural community. Fourth, gendered spaces. The creation, production and use of the arts in cultural practice are premised on indigenous notions of gendered spaces and relationships. Fifth, relationships. The cultural and ritual practice of art production and use are indicators of relational spaces. These reflect the collective or communal dynamic of Pacific cultural communities. And finally, symbolism. Pacific heritage arts are highly symbolic in nature and the kinds of symbolism represented in the various art forms relate in varying degrees to the first five entry points or tenants. Here we see what we could rightly call Pacific handicrafts. Two displays at the Langa Fonua building in Nukualofa, Tonga. These are functional and made with natural materials. Some feature contemporary images of animals and flowers, while others may feature more traditional cultural symbols. These products feed into the tourist market, as well as, to a lesser extent, the local market. They do not meet all of the six entry points discussed in the previous slide. That is, they are functional. They may be produced by a specific gendered group, although not necessarily, and they may contain some elements of design that meet the general tenant for symbolism. However, they do not feature in ritual or ceremony, and they don't tell us anything about spirituality, social order, hierarchy, or relationships. On the other hand, when we look at these specific examples of Pacific heritage arts, we see the six tenants or entry points coming into play. Here, we see the Tongan Tauvala or Kie Kie, these are woven wraps which Tongans wear over their clothing as a sign of respect. In Tonga, all school children and adults are expected to wear this every day. Tongan boys wear the tauvala, a small mat, over their clothing, and girls wear the kie kie, a more decorative piece, over their clothing. In the second image, we see a group of Tongan women from Ewa Island at a formal event wearing the traditional tauvala. Next we see the Fijian tambua or whale's tooth. This is used in ceremonies for formal presentations as a sign of respect and cultural obligation. At the bottom left we have the Samoan fine mat called the ia tonga. It is used in formal presentations again as a sign of respect and cultural obligations. And in the final image, at the bottom right, we see a full arrangement of mats and tapa for a traditional funeral called Nain Davo Davo, or bedding. Again, we see the six tenants playing out in cultural expressions of relational spaces and respect. So simply put, Pacific heritage arts are functional. They tell us something about our shared spirituality based on a holistic worldview in which everyone and all of the cosmos within the universe are interrelated. Our heritage arts tell us about social order or hierarchy and they allow for the demonstration of mutual respect and social cohesion. 
They tell us about gendered spaces and about relationships. And they represent a deep and meaningful symbol base where historical reference points, genealogies, and important values and beliefs are emphasized and reinforced. Here we see more select images including traditional dance performances from Rarotonga or the Cook Islands, Chamorro dancers and orators from Guam, and Rotuman dancers from Fiji. We also see traditional shell money from the Solomon Islands. One of the biggest challenges faced by indigenous communities in the Pacific, which is a shared concern by indigenous peoples all over the world, is cultural appropriation. That is, the unacknowledged and often misrepresented heritage symbols and arts of the Pacific. You may like to read up on the context of cultural appropriation in the Pacific Islands. Some links are provided as supplementary readings. To summarize, Pacific heritage arts provide us with significant entry points into the knowledge systems of indigenous communities in the Pacific Islands. These are reflective of a holistic worldview that is relational at its core. Heritage arts are not handicrafts. They are representative of a particular community and they tell us about the spiritual dynamic of that community. They are subject to change over time just as culture changes. The study of heritage arts can tell us something about the spiritual, cultural dynamic of the role of the cultural artist, whether it be a man or a woman, an individual or a collective activity. And finally, to fully understand heritage arts, we need to decolonize the frames through which we view and interpret these cultural creations, their processes the actors involved, the products or creations, as well as the context in which they are exchanged and used in ceremonies or rituals. This means that we need to dialogue with indigenous people themselves so that they may begin to define and explain their understandings of their own heritage arts. This means decolonizing our lenses and really beginning to see Pacific heritage arts in their correct and rightful cultural contexts. You should now take the time to read through the two articles which have been provided for you and view the second video which is a TEDx talk on Pacific symbols as graphic communication.